So my name is uh, Brother Omar, and I will be, inshallah, the uh, speaker for today's halakha. And we're actually going to be going off of a PowerPoint that I uh, prepared, alhamdulillah. So let us uh, open that up, inshallah. Let's just go to the beginning. Okay. So you should all be see, be able to see my screen at the moment. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So let's begin. Um, okay, first of all, who am I uh, and why am I the one speaking and doing this halakha? Uh, so alhamdulillah, I'm a BC certified teacher. Uh, I'm high school trained, uh, specifically social studies, uh, etc. That, that field. Uh, currently, I'm a grade seven teacher at Surrey Muslim School. And I've taught in local high schools, uh, specifically with the Surrey School District. And I've also taught in Japan, in a public school in Japan, alhamdulillah, as well. So, um, my, alhamdulillah, my experiences are quite diverse. I've also taught at local um, after-school uh, Muslim, Muslim schools, essentially. Um, uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that is, that's currently where I'm at right now. So, our agenda for today, inshallah, we're going to... Depending on the time, uh, my plan is to, my plan is to, inshallah, be done in maximum 45 minutes, my part of the talk, and the rest of the, uh, the lecture, the discussion will be uh, Q&A, inshallah. So our agenda, first and foremost, would be to discuss what exactly are the fitness uh, and slash trials in schools? What are they? Two, what can we do about them? And then last but not least is our question and answer period, inshallah, azawajal. So let's begin. Let's get right into it. The fitna is, um, after a deliberate thought and uh, a lot of thinking about this, I, it's really, there's a lot of things that one can talk about, but what I was able to come up with was really four major things. Um, and a lot of the minor things fall under these four major things. So the four major things are, non-Muslim values slash mindset. Okay, and I'm gonna explain what each of these are. The second one is haram relationships. The third one is alcohol, drugs, gangs. And the last one is uh, LGBTQ+, which is a new one for people who um, are going to school now. When I went to high school, uh, and, and also I think this is important for, for everyone to know, I was born here, alhamdulillah. I was uh, born in Burnaby, spent most of my life in New Westminster. And I went through the system here, the public school system. So I know what it's like being a student and a teacher, alhamdulillah. And this is something that I didn't necessarily deal with, the LGBTQ plus issue, which we'll talk about, inshallah. Uh, so let's get right into it. Non-Muslim value slash mindset. Essentially, if you raise your kids in a public school, or if your kids go to a public school, they are likely going to be uh, leaving with... Um, a lot of non-Muslim values and a very secular mindset. And specifically, this is a result of things like Christmas, Halloween, Valentine's Day, and so on. Now, I want you to imagine what it's like for a kid who doesn't really know much about a lot of things, really. Uh, they don't know much about Islam. They don't know much about other religions. They don't, know, they don't know much about the world. But what they do know is that every time Christmas comes around, Halloween comes around, Valentine's Day, etc., the school throws a party, uh, the teacher has whatever a pizza party or they bring in cake and sweets. Uh, maybe they watch a movie. Maybe they don't do any work. Um, so I want you to think about what's going on in the kid's head when this is happening. Obviously, these events are becoming associated with joy, happiness, fun, and, 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 and the like. So if you are a Muslim kid and you are basically finding pleasure and celebrating Christmas, Halloween, Valentine's Day, and so on. How are you going to respond to your parents when they say, no, we can't do these things because it's haram, right? And the sad reality of this is that a lot of times when Eid comes around, right, our two Eid celebrations, some Muslim parents don't do anything. Eid may go by and, and a kid may not even realize that it's Eid. And this is a tragedy, okay? So I want you to think about what's happening in public schools where they're, where they're basically celebrating all these um, paganistic holidays, or many of them were, were originated, they're, they're founded in paganism, right? And when it comes to Islamic ho holidays, they're not celebrating them at all. So a kid begins to develop kind of 
um, fondness for these holidays, not necessarily realizing what their theological foundations are, but from a kid's perspective, it doesn't really matter because all they know is that Christmas equals fun, Halloween equals fun, Valentine's Day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the two aspects of this. The second one is that a lot of kids, when they go through high school, uh, elementary, they develop what's called a secular mindset. So if you speak to a kid, an average Muslim kid who graduates from a local high school, and you ask them about things like, what are your views on homosexuality? What are your views on marijuana? Uh, what are your views on relationships before marriage? Even though they may be Muslim, they may have a very, very, they may have very secular answers. So they may things like, oh, they may say things like, oh, there's, there's you know, if people, uh, if two men want to be in a relationship, well, well, that's their, that's their business. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. They may say that, or um, they may say, well, you know, actually weed, you know, should be, should be legalized because of all the, um, we can decriminalize basically a lot of the, the people who are being through the system, processed through the system because of marijuana possession charges, et cetera, et cetera. And I know this because I was one of these people. Basically before, alhamdulillah, I, I rediscovered or I discovered the deen, the faith for myself, even though alhamdulillah my parents are Muslim, I used to think in very similar ways. I used to think that, marijuana, that legalizing marijuana was a good idea. I used to think that, you know, not really give too much thought to, to you know, homosexual relationships or, or anything like that. Or, so, so essentially what I'm saying is, a kid starts to develop a very secular mindset when they go through a public education system. And this is very normal because um, these are not only educational institutions, they are basically socializing institutions. And what that means is kids aren't just there to learn math and science. They're there to learn to become certain types of individuals, which our government wants. Okay. And, and that individual basically has a secular mindset. So this can be very dangerous because it can lead kids to question things that are very uh, central tenets of the faith, right? Maybe such as a belief in God. Maybe such as why is this thing haram when everybody says it's okay, et cetera, et cetera. So this can lead kids down a very wrong and dangerous path is what I'm saying. Number, okay. And also um, another aspect of this is the hijab. Now, I, I, I strongly believe that boys have a certain set of challenges that are different than girls and girls have a certain set of challenges when it comes to their lives in school uh, compared to boys. And one of them is the hijab. And I sadly have heard stories of, of at least one person that I know uh, through, through someone basically taking off their hijab in high school and basically living a double, double life where they wear the hijab at home, but then when it comes to high school, they just take it off. Um, and from an outside perspective, I want you to think about what it would be like for a young Muslim girl to be in a class where she's the only one wearing a head covering, okay? And everybody else is, gets to, you know, they, they do their hair differently on different days and they may color their hair and, and et cetera, et cetera. And she's there wearing a hijab. I want you to think about how that could make her feel, okay? This could be tough for an adult, let alone a youth or a child, okay? So this kind of environment, this kind of, um, um, basically, essentially, the fundamental thing is the environment. This kind of environment can be very unhealthy for, uh, for a youth, right, or a child, especially when there are other opportunities out there, such as Islamic schools, homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which we will discuss as well. Number two, haram relationships. And this is one of the biggest fitness for both boys and girls going through the public education system. Now, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but... Uh, I'll, these four fitnas, these four trials, um, are more apparent at different age groups. Okay, so if we're talking KG, this is not really a concern, right? Uh, but the secular mindset stuff still is. Now, this usually applies, in my experience, from kids grade five, sometimes four, sometimes younger, and up. Okay, so what exactly is going on when it comes to haram relationships? There is, and this is something very prevalent in high schools, especially there is a huge dating culture, okay? And this is not always based in reality, but from a very young age, and I can say this myself, having been through high school, I would hear very early on, and I would see very early on, even in elementary school, I would see people being involved in relationships, okay? Actual boyfriend, girlfriend, they would go over, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. Boyfriend, girlfriend, relationships. Um, in grade seven, maybe not as prevalent as when you get older, but still there, okay? So there is definitely a dating culture. And for the average Muslim kid who is going through natural hormonal changes, right, where they're beginning to develop these natural desires, imagine what it would be like for them to be in an environment where everyone around them is either talking about haram relationships, being in haram relationships, and or both, okay? Um, and in my experience, I, I realized that a lot of times boys just say things that are just aren't true, okay? They might say things, oh, look what, oh, I did this with this, and I did this with this, and I did this with, with her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It may, all of that may be lies, but it doesn't matter for the Muslim kid because the Muslim kid is still hearing this. It's still a fitna, it's still a trial for them. And they might start to think, well, you know, maybe they want to do that. Or maybe they're thinking about like, well, it's a natural desire for them. Everyone else is doing it around them. So you can see how much of a trial that can be for them, okay? And one thing I want to say about this is that promiscuity is the norm, okay? It's not, if you went to high school, if you're in grade 12 and you, you spoke out and you said that you're a virgin, that's something that's abnormal. You could be made fun of for that, okay? Even though many others around you may actually be virgins, the promiscuity is the actual norm, okay? And this is something you need to realize as parents who are putting your kids into public school, that by the time they're in grade 12, promiscuity is the norm, okay? Um, the other thing is revealing clothing. And this is, I mean, I'll say this personally, I'll say this very bluntly. This is one of the reasons why I left the public school that I used to work at. Beginning basically grade eight, okay? Not only are the students, but the teachers as well, they may dress in certain ways that can be very difficult for young men and even young women, okay? So especially I find when it comes to the summer months, uh, when it comes to the warmer months, um, and especially with younger kids, I'm not sure what it is because I find that Generally speaking, when you're out in the workplace compared to kids in high school, kids in high school tend to dress way more revealing than workplace, you know, colleagues, etc. So this can be obviously a huge source of fitna for, for young men and women. Um, and it's average, like it's, it's, it's basically, um, uh, it's hindered by the fact, it's further hindered by the fact that, you know, sports, for example, um, a very simple example that a lot of people overlook. Uh, when I was teaching at a local high school, a lot of my kids asked me, Hey, uh, Mr. Abdul Fattah, can we go to watch uh, the senior girls game? And I, I would, I said, no, I, I, I didn't feel like I had to give them a reason, but I said, no. Um, and they said, Oh, well, all the other classes are going. Okay. And in my head, I knew why I, I don't want to take them to watch the senior girls game because I know that there's basically, basically mature women, um, wearing, uh, short shorts and playing basketball. Okay, so this is the way I as a Muslim teacher was thinking, but obviously their non-Muslim teacher might see it as something totally fine, totally okay. And a kid has to go. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna be left in the class. A kid has to go watch those games technically, right? Unless they um, speak to the teacher kindly and they say for religious reasons, I don't wanna go, etc., which is also a possibility. And this is something inshallah we can discuss afterwards as well. So when it comes to haram relationships, this is the fitna. You have a dating culture where promiscuity is the norm, and everyone around you is either talking about haram relationships, uh, being in haram relationships, or inclining towards haram relationships. So you can imagine that for young kids, this can be a huge source of fitna, okay? And even for adults, this is why grown working men, like myself, for example, who's working in public school, this can be a source of fitna for them as well. Okay. Third thing that I'd like to talk about, alcohol, drugs, gangs, vaping. Vaping is a new one. It's, uh, it's a hot topic in schools and it's something that's uh, quite new and the research also, um, we don't really know too much about it, at least the long-term effects, right? And we're, we're gonna discuss that inshallah. So alcohol, drugs, gangs, vaping. I find that a lot of young men uh, tend to be inclined towards gang culture, okay? Not necessarily being in actual gangs or dealing drugs. Now, yes, that does happen and I know personally uh, Muslims who have gone down that path, at least one that I can think of. I know someone who's gone down that path and, 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 you know, obviously their parents as believing Muslims are obviously not happy about the, the path their, their, their son took, but, um, this is the reality, right? This is the reality. 
Um, alcohol, drugs, gangs, vaping, a lot of these things are heavily influenced by uh, music and pop culture, specifically rap and hip hop. To, to say this bluntly and to say this, this is just the truth. Um, a lot of this music promotes gang life, drugs, um, alcohol, vaping, promiscuity, whatever. A lot of this, a lot of the music, which a lot of the kids listen to, whether they intend to or not, because it's all over social media, a lot of this music promotes that. And I've seen it myself where a lot of young, a lot of young men, they basically like to act like gangsters, even though internally they're very good kids. Um, and they, they're not actually, um, as people say, they're not actually involved in that lifestyle. They don't actually have weapons. Some of them may, but I find a lot of them don't. And they just like to like basically act the lifestyle. Um, it can be, one of those fitness for young men, essentially. And it starts, I, th I find, with the music and pop culture. And then it goes into hanging out with the wrong kids. And once you start hanging out with the wrong uh, kids, that's when things can really go bad. That's when things can really go bad. And that's when thoughts of gang life actually turn into actual gang life. Um, drugs, alcohol are one of those things uh, where from an early, I remember when I was maybe, what, grade eight, I started hearing about these, these parties where people were drinking alcohol. And if everyone around you is drinking alcohol or talking about alcohol, what makes you think you won't? Really, right? What makes you think you won't? So this can be a huge source of fitness as well for uh, our kids. Okay? Uh, vaping and its effect. Vaping is a new one. It's said, uh, at least where I was working, that the spot, uh, the boys' bathroom was basically a vaping hotspot, okay? And uh, a lot of these kids have vapes. And, and I remember some of the, my students who were in grade 10 uh, joking to me about, about basically um, about vaping, essentially. It's something that's become very normal. Now, I recently learned this, but vaping actually has some very negative effects. I see, is there... Okay, we're going to, ins inshallah, uh, talk about that, inshallah. Uh, we have one question and we will, uh, inshallah, address, address all the questions towards the end, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. So vaping and its effects. Um, okay, so this is research that I got from uh, the Government of Canada Health website. So vaping is not harmless, meaning vaping is potentially harmful. Vaping can increase your exposure to harmful, harmful uh, chemicals. By the way, this is what a vape looks like. Um, Vaping can increase your exposure to harmful chemicals. Vaping can lead to nicot nicot nicotine addiction. Obviously not all vapes have nicotine, but the majority of them uh, do. Um, and essentially what vapes are, for those who don't know, they're kind of like this electric cigarette where kids basically inhale and then, and then blow out. Kind of like a cigarette, essentially. Uh, but it's not a cigarette. It's an electric cigarette in ways. The long-term consequences of vaping are unknown. It's rare, but defective vaping products, especially batteries, may catch fire or uh, even explode. Uh, I'm just trying to minimize this. Yeah. Or even explode, leading to burns and injuries. And the risks of nicotine. We know nicotine is, is generally very addictive. So nicotine is a highly addictive chemical. Youth are especially susceptible to its negative effects, as it can alter their brain, de brain development and can affect memory and concentration. It can also lead to addiction and physical dependence. Source, Government of Canada. So I got this directly from the Government of Canada Health website. Um, this is, vaping is new, so we don't know the long-term effects of it. Uh, but as you can see that it can definitely uh, alter brain, brain development or nicotine addiction, um, can alter brain development and can affect memory and concentration. And you need memory and concentration in high school to do well in your classes, right? So these are the risks of vaping. And I can tell you vaping is, uh, vaping I find is almost like, in some ways, it's the new marijuana. When I was in high school, everyone was talking about marijuana. They were doing marijuana. Now it seems to be vaping and sadly marijuana as well. Okay. So, and I want to say, so, I want to make something very clear about alcohol, drugs, etc. Kids actually do these things. I remember, and I've, I've seen it with my own eyes and, and, and forgive me if I'm being blunt. Uh, but I think as parents, you need to hear this. Um, it seemed to me that the majority in high school, when I was in high school, were doing marijuana. In fact, it didn't stop at marijuana. A lot of the kids in my grad class, a lot of them were doing cocaine as well and other hard drugs. 
and they would talk about it. They would talk about it to me openly. Okay. So this is something that is real. It's something that is, is prevalent. It's something that's happening in our schools. And as parents, you need to know about it and you need to, you need to really, um, inshallah, equip yourself to, to protect your kids in the best way possible by the permission of Allah. Okay. LGBTQ plus, this is a new fitna LGBTQ plus and sorry by fitna. I know we, not everybody may know what that means. Fitna, it means trial. It's a trial or a test. So fitna is a trial, and this is one of those new trials that kids go through in uh, elementary and high school. Um, so LGBTQ+, and maybe even before that, actually. So LGBTQ+, is an acronym that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, and more. Okay? So LGBTQ+, encompasses all these things into one acronym. Okay? And this is an idea or, or this is, um, how do I say this? This is a movement that is being promoted, endorsed in schools. Okay. It is being promoted and endorsed in schools. There is something called the SOGI curriculum. Okay. SOGI stands for sexual orientation and gender identity. So, uh, the SOGI curriculum is not curriculum in the way that math is. So for example, kids have to learn math. And if you go to BC curriculum, you'll see math, social studies, physical and health education, et cetera. So you won't find SOGI there, but it is still practically mandated. And, and you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. SOGI curriculum is basically, uh, it's embedded into school policies. For example, with the Vancouver School Board, they updated their policy, I believe in 2016. And they said that basically the school board will work to ensure that um, uh, people of all, um, of, of gender identities, people of all gender identities will be positively, really positively reflected in the curriculum and in library books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is what you see here, the bottom right picture, this day in June is a book, which we will discuss, uh, shortly, inshallah. Uh, okay. I will, inshallah, uh, address uh, towards the end. So Soji curriculum you will find in things like stories, movies, lessons, etc. Now I want to make something very, very clear here. Um, and actually, I think it would be better if I said it after I show you what exactly the Soji curriculum is. Essentially, what you have is teachers beginning to use stories, movies, lessons that challenge heteronormativity. What that means is the idea that a male and a female being together is the norm. There are, they're basically putting out books and lessons and movies that challenge this idea that is ancient. It's mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the old Testament. It's mentioned in the Quran. This is ancient. Okay. And they are putting out this curriculum and these, these resources to challenge this idea. Okay. And I'll give you some examples. Okay. This is one of those books. This it's called this day in June. And this is a, a children's book, which I will point your attention to here. First of all, you notice the children's ages is, is age four to eight, okay? Four to eight years old. That's quite young, as you know. I want you to look at the book's description. It says, just read the last sentence. This day in June is an excellent tool for teaching respect, acceptance, and understanding of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Now, the key word here is acceptance, okay? As Muslims, and I'll say this bluntly, we will never... I shouldn't say we will never, right? We seek Allah's protection from, from being misguided. The religion will never accept these things as being something that is acceptable. Never. The religion is very clear on these matters, okay? But what's going on in public schools is that they are teaching kids to accept these things as being completely normal, okay? This is just one example. I actually got this book off of a list of books, uh, Soji books. Uh, there's a website that basically... Um, it's a resource for teachers who want to teach explicitly the Soji uh, curriculum. And I got this book from there. Here's another, this is part of a lesson plan that's actually on the British Columbia Teachers Federation uh, lesson, plan, uh, lesson plan database. Um, and if you read here, kids are being asked to, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So if you read here, kids are being asked, instruct students to walk around and introduce themselves based on their assigned cards. So if my son, I don't have any children, but if your son, let's say your daughter, were to, were to basically be in this class, they would have to go around and say, hi, my name is Aaron. Please call me they. 
My name is Andrew, please call me he. My name is Bailey, please call me she. And then my name is Lee, please call me he. This is actually, there's, there's a whole, uh, this is multiple pages. But you can see here that by choosing to, to avoid basically he or she, they are, um, they are basically introducing the idea of preferred pronouns. Okay, and what that means is a person can refer to themselves in whatever way they want. So as a male, obviously, alhamdulillah, I say, I, my, my pronoun, it is not a choice, I say he, okay? But in schools now, kids have choices. If you're a boy, you can refer to yourself as she, you can refer to yourself as Z, Zer, and there's a whole list of other ones, okay? And this is, again, this isn't something that they're just teaching your kids about. I wanna make this clear. This is not just saying these, these, this community exists. I myself, when I was teaching Law 12, I taught my kids about, uh, about basically um, gay rights movements from a historical perspective. It was a law class and I taught them about it from a historical perspective, but I never said this was okay to do. I just said, this is what, this is what it was and this is what it is now, okay? But here they are teaching kids to accept this. And this is what the problem is. Here is another example, okay? This is part of the same lesson plan. Now this lesson, it doesn't make sense right now, but design a dress for Bailey. This is based off of, off of a book called 10,000 Dresses, okay? Uh, by Marcus Stewart, Marcus uh, Uwer, sorry. This is a book in which the story is a boy basically has dreams of wearing uh, dresses of various kinds and various materials, I believe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and his parents obviously are not okay with that. They're telling him, you're a boy, right? Uh, but then he finds a friend who helps him come to realize his dreams, basically, of wearing a dress, okay? Now, here the kids are designing a dress for Bailey. They're designing a dress for the boy, okay? And what does Allah say in the Quran? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان and cooperate in righteousness and taqwa, God consciousness and don't cooperate in sin and aggression. This is sin. So we cannot allow our children to cooperate in things of this nature. Okay? I believe, بسم الله. I think was uh, inshallah this is a great question uh i will uh address that inshallah okay um okay the other thing i want to say about this so one of the benefits that i have now i i could tell you for sure that there are teachers in our community who i personally look up to and who have more experience than me in in public schools and private schools, okay? One of them may be here right now. I'm not sure if my principal is here, but if he is here, assalamu alaikum to him and to all of you. Um, one of the things though, and the reason I'm saying this is because one of the things that gives me an advantage to speak about this is I recently graduated my Bachelor of Education program. I recently, I recently finished it. Uh, I think in, uh, it was the summer of 2019. Yes, summer of 2019, alhamdulillah, I graduated from UBC with my Bachelor of Education. And I can tell you as a fresh teacher that this Soji curriculum was heavily endorsed. So much so to the point that I felt like I was being suffocated or being forced to accept this ideology. And, and even more than that, I literally thought, and Allah is my witness, that I wouldn't even be able to make it through the program because of how much it bothered me, essentially. I felt like I was being force fed this ideology um, and, and I felt like I didn't have a choice. And, and one day, uh, if there's time, I can discuss it. But essentially, one day, I, I literally spoke out in front, of a, in front of a, we had a guest lecturer who was speaking about Soji. And one of the most ridiculous things uh, that he said was, basically, he, was, he said that the whole idea of, of a binary between a man and a woman, binary means two things, right? So men and women, he said that whole idea is a result of colonialism. I said, Allahu Akbar, colonialism is what, 500, 600? 700 years, we're talking about the, the, the Bible, we're talking about the Torah, we're talking about the Quran 1400 years ago, who mentioned these things, right? Like about Adam and, and, uh, and his wife, subhanAllah. And, and he's trying to convince me that the whole idea of, of men and women being the two genders uh, is something that's, that's new. Um, anyways, I actually ended up speaking out in front of the class and um, uh, subhanAllah, I, I ended up um, 
complaining to the university because I felt like um, it was ridiculous that um, this was actually just after, this was after um, the New Zealand mosque terrorist attack, okay? And I felt like you're propagating this under the name of inclusion, okay? And we have a person who goes in and kills 51 of my brothers and sisters, and you are not mentioned, I had one class about Islamophobia, one, and we've had at least, what, two or three sessions about this? So I, I, it, was very, it was very difficult for me to even make it through the program. But alhamdulillah, Allah is the most wise. And, and now I'm here, alhamdulillah, to, to tell you about these experiences. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So anyways, this is just one of the many fitnas that are happening and that are affecting our, um, our youth. Um, so let's inshallah move on. So what exactly do we do about it? Okay, what do you do about it? This is a very important question. We know what's out there. What do you do about it? Okay, here are some solutions. Number one, you need to build a loving relationship with your child. You need to. If your child feels more comfortable to talk to um, their friends at school or, or whoever it may be other than yourself, that is a huge problem. Okay? And I want to remind you that Allah describes Luqman in Surah Luqman in the Quran. He says that he gave Luqman hikmah, wisdom. And what is the first thing that Luqman says to his son? Ya bunayya. Ya bunayya. Okay? So, bunayya here is, is, a, is a, oh my son, but it's said in a way of affection. Not, oh my son. Oh my son. Okay? Oh my son. It's said in a way of affection. Okay? And parents need to have a loving relationship with their children to the point where they can actually speak to you about what's going on in school. Okay? And you need to, and this is a reminder for myself first and foremost, we need to make time for our children. Our children aren't just something that you, they're, they're not just like a, they're not just addition to your life, okay? They're an amana. And this is what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, right? Kullukum ra'in wa kullu ra'in mas'ulin an rayatihi. Every single one of you is a shepherd and each shepherd is responsible for his flock, okay? So your children are under you, at least until a certain age. So we need to make time for them. And what that means is, not sitting at a living room or not eating dinner with your phone in your hand and, and looking at some uh, WhatsApp video about how coronavirus is a conspiracy or whatever. It's really making time for your children, unplugging, sitting down with them and speaking to them, being fully present while you are speaking with them. Okay? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. And then basically how, ask how things are going indirectly. Okay. Um, what I mean by this is this, in my experience, having uh, a number of younger siblings, kids hate it when, or they don't like it. I should say hate it, but they don't like it when you ask, how was school? How was school? they oftentimes they'll just say good. And that's the end of the conversation. So in my experience, what I've come to realize is that you want to ask them about school in a way that's indirect. Okay. So what that means is like, um, for example, and oftentimes it can be a leading question. So for example, I might say like, hey, uh, uh, how was basketball today in PHE or in PE? I don't know what they're doing in PHE, let's just say. I just guessed, right? And then, and then she, she might say, right? Or he might say, oh, uh, we, we didn't actually play basketball. We played something else. And then, and then you see how that can open up a whole nother conversation and say, oh, okay, well, what did you play? Oh, okay. And then... And then, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They might say, oh, well, we played soccer today. I'll say, oh, whose team were you on, right? And did you win? Did you lose? And then I find that once you get kids talking, sometimes they don't stop. And this is good as a parent because you want to know what's going on. And I found that just by doing this, I was able to find out basically who are they hanging out with? What are their friends' names? What are, what are their friends like? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can find out a lot. So my point here is don't say, um, how was school? right? Because oftentimes they'll just say good. And that's the end of the conversation. Try to get them to talk about school indirectly. Okay. Like for example, uh, like what unit are you doing in socials or, um, anything, anything really that's more leading, I would say. And that's more specific. Okay. Try to ask specific questions, right? Oh, Hey, did you do integers in math today? 
No, we did something else. So you see how that kind of forces them to say something else. And then through that, you can inshallah open up a larger conversation. Communication, can they talk to you? This, is, uh, this goes under the first one. So I'm not gonna spend too much time about this, but can they basically talk to you? And one important concept that I wanna mention here is positive versus negative mentoring. Uh, and I recently attended a, a lecture by uh, Mufti Asim, where he talked about the difference between positive commands and negative commands. And what that means is, do not just raise your kids around don't, 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 don't. If, if, if you educate your kids just by saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this. What are they going to do? Okay. He's, he suggested that a better way, and I definitely see his point in this, a better way to teach your kids akhlaq, good manners, respect, and all things that are good. A better way to do it is by positive commands. So don't say like, don't do this. Tell them, do this. And of course, he was basing this off of the best example that we have, which is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So instead of always saying, don't, 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 say do. Like instead of saying, um, uh, I'll give you an example. Don't stand on the chair. Habibi, sit on the chair. Or beta, I know in Urdu they say beta. Sit on the chair, okay? Sit on the chair, okay? Don't say, don't stand on the chair. Beta, sit on the chair. Okay, you see the difference there? And he actually did an experiment where um, he found that he actually asked kids, I think they were in grade two, he gave them a list of statements. Half of them were don't statements, half of them were do statements, positive statements. And the kids, by and large, they all of them preferred the do statements because it empowered them. Because by telling them sit down or do this, they're thinking that you actually believe in them enough that they can do it. You're empowering them, right? You're giving them, you're basically empowering them to do good, essentially. So basically use positive commands instead of negative commands all the time. Now, yes, of course, there is a time and place for negative commands, right? They're mentioned in the Quran, right? لا تقرب الزنا, right? لا تقتل النفس, right? So don't approach adultery. Don't, uh, don't kill, right? Um, these things are mentioned in the Quran. But of course, as parents, you have to use your hikmah, you have to use wisdom when it comes to raising children, especially in this country, okay? Um, three, get involved. Uh, parent advisory committee, get, get involved. Every single school has a PAC. And this, when I was teaching in Japan, their, their, their pack there was heavily involved. Um, and here, there are some packs that are also heavily involved, right? So get involved, know what's going on. You can have a say in the school, okay? Parent-teacher night, same thing. If you're one of those parents that never attends parent-teacher night, I think you should because you can get a lot out of the teacher that you may not get out of your son or daughter, okay? So attend, uh, be, be involved. You know those letters, another thing, those letters that you often receive at home, those letters that the kids send for you to look over, read them, take the time to actually read them. Now, I understand that for a lot of the parents, English may not be a first language, and I know reading a full-page letter is, is, is quite a feat. So uh, get them to help you out. Or if you have a friend who maybe knows English better, get them to help you out. But the point is you want to know what's going on. You want to be involved in your child's education, not just drop them off and, and pick them up every day, but actually be involved in their education and know what's going on. Four, um, after-school programs. Um, there are many, alhamdulillah, many after-school programs. Uh, we have Islamic hips programs and memorizing the Quran and, and lessons and stuff like that. But I want to state that this doesn't just have to be Islamic, okay? I think one of the things that helped me stay out of trouble in high school, now that I look back on it, is actually basketball. Alhamdulillah, I played basketball all throughout from, from grade 8 to grade 12. Um, and, and it was something that I, that I basically uh, was very serious about. And I dedicated a lot of time to it. Like it was something that I was very into. And I think about, yes, you know, we're not supposed to be obsessed with things that are, that are, that are basically not deemed, not religion uh, related. But as a kid, I realized that putting my efforts into basketball ensured that I wasn't putting my efforts into something else. And just the mere fact that I was going to basketball practices, games, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, these things, these things basically fill up your time in ways that bad things can no longer fill up your time because you're doing those other things, right? So sports can be a great way to, inshallah, number one, stay active, um, learn 
key skills such as leadership, respect, teamwork, etc. And, and they can also keep kids out of trouble. And I know that because there's one kid, subhanAllah, uh, who I think he tried out for the grade nine basketball team. And I felt like he should have made it, but he didn't. And ever since that time, I saw who he was hanging out with and the trajectory that he was going. And it took him down the bad path. It took him down a bad path. And I think, subhanAllah, if this kid made the basketball team, he would have probably spent more time with us. And alhamdulillah, like generally, just the kids who are able to fill the commitments of being on any team, such as attending practices, doing what you have to do, getting uh, permission slips signed, fees, etc. They could be better friends than kids, uh, than other kids maybe. Okay? Better company than other kids maybe. Uh, coding is another, uh, coding is another big one. Okay? Uh, a lot of kids, mashallah, tabarakallah, we have a lot of uh, engineers in the community, mashallah, tabarakallah. And, and a lot of the parents may aspire for the kids to be engineers as well. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, so coding, I know, is one of those things that, that is, uh, it's a new kind of after school program. So if your kids are into that, get them involved in that. And inshallah, they can, the point is they can be kids in ways that are productive. They can be kids in ways that are productive and not ways that are unproductive. Okay. And lastly, Muslim schools, alternate education. For me, I, I, and this is, goes to one of those questions. Um, for me, it is a no brainer. Um, at and I'll say this bluntly, and I know that people have different situations which makes this difficult. But for me, I say there's absolutely no way on this planet that I would ever put my kid in a public school right now. No way. I would rather perform hijrah, like leave the country, than put my kid in a public school right now. Because your children are an amana. Your job isn't. Your job, you can get another job. You can move to another country, right? Allah says his earth is very spacious. But your children, they go with you wherever you go. Okay? So, so Muslim schools, basically, for me right now, in our, in our current environment, it's either Muslim school or no school, essentially. No public school, as in, like, no public school, I should say. Okay? Now, there are options, though. There are options. Okay? So, what are the various schooling options? Number one, obviously, you have your Muslim schools. In the lower mainland, we have Suri Muslim School. We have BC Muslim School. Both of those are under the BCMA. You have Iqra, which is another, with an, which is another Muslim school. Uh, so you have those three, those, you have those three, um, uh, those, three, those three Muslim schools, alhamdulillah. Um, you have distance education options. You have iLearn, which is local here in Surrey. Um, and they basically do what's called digital versus blended. So digital is all done online and blended, some, some in-person, some online. Um, that is also an option. Uh, you also have sale. Um, SubhanAllah, sale. What, Applied integrated, applied integrative learning, I think. Uh, anyway, I forgot what SAIL stands for, but anyways. Um, SAIL is another option for, for youth, and it, it, it's, it's in some ways uh, blended learning as well. So kids can do stuff online, but they also go in once in a while. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how the timing schedule is broken down or what exactly the various different options are, but I know for sure that this is a distance education option that is available in, in uh, at least Surrey. It's actually done out of the uh, Surrey School Board building. Uh, homeschooling is also another option. Parents, you have your rights. You have a right to homeschool your, to homeschool, homeschool your children. Um, and I know that this is not practical for a lot of parents, but this is an option. And, and the best way to find out is really just to go, if you just type in uh, Ministry of Education Homeschooling, inshallah, you'll find uh, the information that you need to, uh, to go down that path. Okay. Uh, that essentially concludes my presentation. Uh, we're going to begin the, the Q&A now, inshallah. And uh, this is my email. If any of you want to contact me, I'll leave this up right now. Uh, feel free to email me. And uh, inshallah, I'll get back to you when I'm able to. And uh, let us begin with some of the questions. So if you have a question, I would just say, um, for now, let's say, well, let's type the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll go through the type questions first, I should say, but then you also have the option of just raising your hand. Inshallah, you can, you can also just verbally say your question as well. And I just want to say, I am not a mufti. I'm not an Islamic scholar. So any question that says, is this halal or is this haram? If I don't know, I'll just say, I don't know. Um, and any questions that I don't know, I just have to say, I don't know. So inshallah, I'll try my best to answer, but I apologize in advance if there's, if there's anything that um, you really want to know that I, I just don't know. Okay. Bismillah. So we're just going to, we're just going to start uh, with the very first question, inshallah. Okay. 
So uh, Muslims with single income households and big families cannot afford Islamic schools and homeschooling isn't possible. How do they raise kids going to public schools? Can you plan a session on how to do to, to how to uh, on how do our children study in public and protect themselves? You can answer at the end, inshallah. Okay, how do they raise kids? And homeschooling isn't uh, possible. Okay, how do they raise kids going to public schools? Um, okay, first of all, I want to say just a general principle. Going into public school does not guarantee, does not mean that your kid is going to come out to be a kafir or, or a mushrik or, or, or someone who, who has a lifestyle that's against their religion. It does not mean that. Alhamdulillah, I myself, I went to public school. I know of at least one mufti in the lower make it, mainland who went to a public school. So public school doesn't automatically equal the misguidance, okay? It's a trial, but it doesn't automatically equal misguidance. Allah guides whom he wills and he lets go astray who he, whom he wills. And to give you a perfect example of this, there are people who grow up in Muslim countries who leave the religion, okay? People who, who can grow up in Muslim countries who leave the religion, okay? So just because you're, 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 you do all the right things doesn't necessarily mean that your child's gonna be guided because guidance is in the hands of Allah. When Allah was addressing our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, indeed, O Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, you do not guide whom you will, but Allah guides whom he wills. So that's just, I just want to say that out there. Um, so how do you raise kids going to public schools? I would say the best thing you can do is be that very open and communicative parent. Be the parent who your kids can tell you about anything. Because I can tell you, it's better that they tell you than their friends at school who are going to give them, especially if they're not Muslim, who may give them very wrong advice. So be a very open and communicative parent, okay? And be involved, as we said. Know what's going on. And in fact, alhamdulillah, my parents, from a very early age, for example, they would take me out of uh, music class, right? They would, uh, they, would, they would not let me participate in like Halloween and Christmas activities. So they, they would make those efforts. So make those efforts, be involved, know what's going on, be aware and, and make those efforts. Um, in regards to the SOGI curriculum, the LGBTQ+, that one is tough because uh, you don't always know. You don't always know kind of what, uh, you don't know what, what, your, what your teacher may be teaching, right? Now, a lot of teachers, because they know that this is a sensitive issue, they will send a letter home saying that we're gonna be doing this story and kind of prep the parents for it. Um, so if you get that letter, then see what ways you can basically take your kid out of those classes, okay? And if you're not able to, then that puts you in a very tough situation. Um, now, that's, that's something we can consider. Can you plan a session on how do our children study in public and protect themselves? Um, our intention with this first session was basically to see what the, entrance was, what the interest is in the community, what the demand is, and um, to go forward. So we may very well have multiple sessions with, with different speakers, um, so inshallah, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Now, just one last thing. Um, how do they raise their kids going to public school? I would say those, those two things. Um, and also I would just say, do not write off Islamic school because um, I know at least in the, in the school that I work at, there are those funds that are in place for parents who are in need. So I would say, do your best to reach out and try, right? Try to register your kids in the Islamic schools. Don't just say, oh, well, I can't afford it because they may have a solution for you. Um, and if there is no solution, if there is no solution, and for whatever reason, you cannot leave to another place that's better for you and your family, then we say, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden a soul beyond its capacity. So to give you an example, if somebody was in this country, they've tried everything they could to put their kids in a Muslim school, they can't afford it. And for whatever reason, they cannot leave the country, for whatever reason it may be. Right there, for whatever reason, I, this is a principle in the Sharia. We know this from the Quran. Allah does not burden a soul uh, beyond its capacity. Okay. Um, okay. How do we change the mindset that Islamic schools will limit our kids' overall growth or put them behind other kids in getting into good universities? Okay, um, this is a very good question. This is a whole systematic, this, this requires a whole systematic change, okay? Um, I can tell you right now that under the leadership we have, alhamdulillah, at Surrey Muslim School, 
we are making the steps, we're making the changes to get very qualified Muslim teachers. Now, there, there, may be a lot of, there may be a lot of teachers, right? Muslim teachers. And there may be a lot of certified teachers, but they're not Muslim. But getting certified Muslim teachers is always the goal, okay? And this is something that schools kind of compete with, right? To get those certified Muslim teachers. Um, but basically, essentially what the step is, we need the support from the community to put funding into our schools essentially so that we can afford to compete with public schools and get qualified Muslim teachers, okay? To get qualified Muslim teachers. And the way to change the mindset really is to, um, again, know what's going on in your school, know who your teacher is. Alhamdulillah, I would, I would, be, I would be in some ways offended, not offended, but I, I would be wondering or questioning if my parents, if, if the parents of my grade sevens um, thought that the quality of the education they were getting in my class is anywhere less than the quality of education they're getting in public school. In fact, I can tell you that as a Muslim, I feel more invested in my kids at the Muslim school than I felt when I was teaching in the public school, even though I had Muslim kids in my classes, okay? I felt more invested because I know that these kids, what their experiences are and where they're going, and I feel invested in their success in this life and the next, inshallah. So um, the way we change the mindset is to make sure that our schools are actually getting certified teachers, certified Muslim teachers. And the added thing is not just a certified Muslim teacher, because there's many people who are Muslim, but maybe they don't pray or they don't wear the hijab, et cetera, et cetera. And that can be confusing for kids. That can be confusing for kids. So ideally we want certified Muslim practicing teachers. Uh, how are other communities like Orthodox Christians dealing with this fitna in public schools? Good question. Uh, I can tell you, at least I know of one uh, Christian school principal who is um, supportive of our kind of stance against this. And obviously for, for conservative Orthodox Christians, um, this is something that is not okay. Now, now um, yeah, so if, for, for conservative or Orthodox Christians, this is something that is not okay. And the way they're dealing with it is essentially the same thing. I mean, they, they have their own schools, they have their own institutions, and um, they also take a stance uh, against it. Okay, assalamu alaikum. My, uh, okay, I'm just gonna try and uh, not read out the whole question to not reveal. I'll just say the question, the gist of it. Okay, uh, basically the question was about, um, first of all, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The question was about uh, when, a, when, a child was a, when a child was basically a toddler or he was a little boy, pre-verbal to toddler, he liked dresses and the parents allowed it uh, and they didn't take it seriously. And he did not take it seriously either. But when he was five to six years old, he was no longer attracted to girls' attires. Was it sinful for, for you to indulge him while he was one to two years old? Um, again, the question of halal haram, I don't feel um, I'm uh, equipped to answer that, but I can tell you for, for certain that um, this is not something that we, should, that we should ever promote in our religion, even with, um, even with, our, with our younger kids, okay? Uh, even if a, if a kid wants to dress or like a, like a boy two to three years old, they want to dress, you wouldn't indulge them in that. Just like for example, um, you wouldn't incline them towards haram things at a young age thinking they'll just snap out of it or grow out of it, right? That's a false mentality. So, so I wouldn't do that. Now, whether it's, whether it's, it's considered a sin in the sight of Allah or something that's makruh, disliked or whatever, I would ask a mufti uh, about that. But I can tell you for sure it's something that definitely we should not be doing. Um, SAIL, thank you very much. Sir, uh, SAIL stands for Suri Academy of Innovative Learning. Yes. Jazakumullah khair. Um, are the distance learning Islamic? Uh, are they Islamic? As far as I know, there's one new, I have to, before I, before I, I say that, I have to really confirm and, and, and check, uh, make sure everything is okay. But generally speaking, distance learning options, they, um, they're, they're just that. Like the kids are gonna learn math, uh, English, socials from home, essentially. So you get the curriculum or you get resources and you go through it. Um, under the guidance of a teacher from far away, essentially, via the internet. So are they Islamic? Um, they may not be, but at least with, and, and likely they're not. To be honest with you, likely they're not. 
Um, and I would actually say probably they're not, they're not. Um, but at least by doing that, you're avoiding the fitness such as um, the haram relationships, the fitness of, of being in a place where everybody's involved in haram relationships, the revealing clothing, uh, the secular uh, and, and the, not only the secular, but the anti-Islamic holidays. You get to avoid all that with distance education. So in some ways it's more Islamic than being in a public school, absolutely, right? And you have more flexibility with, that, with how you teach at home, um, uh, et cetera. So I would say it's definitely better, uh, but it's still not fully Islamic in the sense that, for me, Islamic education is like you integrate aspects of the religion into the public school curriculum, which is what we try to do. Um, so it's not like that. You're not gonna be learning about the Sira or Quran, uh, it, like at sale, for example, right? Aleph Academy, yes, is a new distant learning program that is Islamic based and the founders are Muslim, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I actually know the founders. That's just one thing I wanted to just uh, get a little bit more information on. Uh, but yes, that is a new uh, distance learning program that is Islamic based and, and the founders are Muslim, alhamdulillah. Yes, um, and it's called Aleph Academy if anybody wants to go in and, and take a look. Um, oh, sorry about that. It's 11, yeah, sorry about that. Um, Seeing this is a question. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, what yakum? Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just some people were sending me uh, screenshots. Much. Okay. Okay, sorry. The, uh, so, as a question, is a screenshot in the form? Huh? So, the question was um, why don't we come together with Christians and push the BC and federal government back regarding what they teach at schools? At age five, we do not let our kids to cross the street along. Why in the world would we allow them to teach what gender they are? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I 100% agree with that. Um, and this reminds me of a story. Now, now, some people think this is laughable. It actually is laughable, um, but it's something that's very serious. I know a teacher personally who told me that I think it was like a grade two kid or a grade one. A teacher asked them what gender they wanted to be. And this Muslim teacher, may Allah bless him, he said that a kid can't even decide what flavor of ice cream they want to have. And you're telling them to decide what gender they want to be. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So I agree with you 100%. Um, why don't we come together with Christians and push the BC back? This will, this will happen. This will happen. If, if it gets to the point where, where we're mandated to do this, even in public schools, this may very well happen. Like I, 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 I tell you myself, I will, not, I will not remain silent about this, right? And, and, and me speaking out almost got me in trouble when I, was, when I was a student at UBC. In fact, I was actually threatened. I was partially threatened, and not really partially, I was indirectly threatened by uh, one of the admin at the school, basically saying that, we have to be satisfied that teachers uh, conform to a certain standard, right? Where they're able to teach in public schools, okay? So um, this is something that will, will likely happen if, if, if the government keeps pushing this. Um, and at the end of the day, we have to realize as Muslims, we, we cannot feel shy. We cannot, we cannot be passive about this, right? In this country, we have a right, according to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, section two, freedom of religion. We have a right to believe what we want. We have a right to express ourselves in the way that we want, right? And it's not hate speech to say that we're against this. It is not. Don't be fooled. It is not hate speech. It's simply saying, these are our values. We don't want to jeopardize or compromise these values. And we're going to stand firm. Not like everybody else who changes their, who changes their views about things every, every, uh, with the seasons, you know what I mean? So we are firm about this and we need to stand firm. So um, this is something that, I think there has been talks about at, this, at the more senior level, but uh, whether it's only Muslim schools or all the religious schools or whatever coming together, um, somebody has to take a stand. Somebody has to take a stand. And if anyone should do it, it'll be the Muslims, inshallah. Do we have another question? Was the same question? Okay. I think it might have been the same question. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, um, if there was a Muslim high school 
in the lower mainland, do you think there would be the same type of fitna? Would you recommend a teen to go to Muslim high school? Um, okay. Uh, if there was a Muslim high school, do you think there would be? No, absolutely not. Uh, there wouldn't be the same. There would be some type of fitna, obviously, but it's not the same in the sense that um, in Muslim school, you won't find kids walking down the street holding hands, okay? Or kissing in the hallways, or uh, a kid, I don't know, jamming to rap music outside of class, or even wearing something that is not Sharia compliant, or you, you won't find these things. Now, th that's not to say that in a Muslim school, there's no fitna whatsoever, because obviously there is. But at least a true Muslim school will try its best to limit the fitna in, in what ways it can, right? And, and if you think about, um, if you think about what our dean teaches us, uh, my ideal would be in a Muslim school where you have basically grade 10s, 11s, and 12s, right? Ideally, there would, at there would be separation. If not separation, then at least one gender sits at the front, one gender sits at the back, just like how we pray Salah, for example, right? And that limits the fitna greatly. There's no like in group projects, the boys and girls aren't working together. They're not exchanging numbers to work on whatever, uh, to study for a test, et cetera, et cetera. There's none of that. So there would be some types of fitna, absolutely, right? Uh, but it's definitely going to be better than public school. Would I recommend a teen to go to a Muslim high school? Absolutely, I would. Um, inshallah, this is, this is our vision. This is my, me personally. Inshallah, this is, I ask Allah to make this happen. Um, a Muslim high school fully functioning up to grade 12 within five years, inshallah. Inshallah, and it will happen, inshallah. So alhamdulillah, I feel like we have the right people working on it now. And, um, and, and it will happen within five years, inshallah. Uh, but we need the support of the community. We need the support of parents. We need the support of the masajids. And, and we need everybody's support because um, the way I see it is, is it's truly tragic when I see, for example, we have, for example, you have Khalsa schools, you have more than one. You even have a Jewish school, right? And if you just think about our numbers, our sheer numbers compared to some of the other populations, right? I don't feel like there's any excuse for us not to have one, right? So inshallah, we're getting there. And we are the only major province in Canada, by the way, that doesn't have one, okay? Ontario has one, right? Quebec has one, et cetera, et cetera. Even one of the prairie provinces, I think, has one. So we are the only major province in Canada that doesn't have one, but inshallah, it's time. And, and, and we will have one soon, inshallah. Today, kids stay for around uh, seven hours every day learning about non-Islamic courses. Do you think they, they need all these classes? Why can't we have an Islamic school that teaches just enough science, but actually focuses on what is important, like Arabic, Quran, Hadith? Do you think that will hurt their chance into getting to a good university? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, personally, this is a personal thing. I've, I've always felt this. I think the amount of schooling that kids get is uh, sometimes way too much. Uh, like for example, in high school, I was teaching three, hour, three classes, one hour and 20 minutes each. And the kids, I had one prep, right? Or one off time, let's say. Uh, they, so the kids are in class, four classes, hour, 20 minutes each, two of them back to back, lunch in between. Kids have quite short attention spans. So I think putting them in school for that long, it's not as productive as it could be. Um, now, the reality is just like everything else, there's a lot of politics that go into schooling. Um, schooling is basically, um, one of my students said this, it's, it's a daycare with books. So the school day has to kind of coincide with the parents' work day because it serves a dual purpose of educating children and to being a source of like kind of um, supervision for children when their parents are at work. So do I think that, um, they need all these classes? No. Do I think that a lot of times they absorb what they learn? No. Um, and do I think it's way too much and it can bore a kid? Yes. And this is why a lot of kids, they just don't like school, right? Um, and why can't we have an Islamic school that teaches just enough science, but actually focuses on what's important? First of all, um, this, this is also something that I've recently been in discussion about um, with one of, one of the local admins. Um, the, the issue is we live in this land. And accordingly, we, are, we have to abide by the laws of the land if we, if we want to live here, right? And this is, this is a principle in the Sharia. As long as the law of the land doesn't require us to do something that is against the Sharia of Allah and his, and his messenger, right? So, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, um, if we just had, if we just opted out of school and opted out of being regulated by the government, just taught our kids ourselves. Now, yes, they could learn. Maybe they could learn more than kids in public school, but they wouldn't get that dogwood diploma that basically allows them to go to universities, which is what we want for our kids. We want for our kids success in this life and the next. So that is kind of the objection to that. Unless somehow you can convince the government to let you do it, 
then that's a whole nother story. But uh, that's not going to be at a teacher level. That would be senior admin um, and stuff like that. But the short answer is we need to abide by the government's regulations to get funding for our kids, essentially, and to, to ensure that kids can actually graduate with a, graduate with a high school diploma. Uh, for Quran, Jazakumullah khair. Somebody shared uh, a link uh, for Quran and Arabic courses. Jazakumullah khair. And wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, uh, inshallah, this is, this is recorded. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is, this is recorded, yes. Um, now, yeah, so there is a, a, an online Muslim high school right now. I have heard of this, uh, the high school by the BCMA. Um, I am not, I don't know if it's actually still active. So I, I'm not sure. I, I have seen posters of it, at least one local message. So, uh, but I'm not sure if it's actually still being if it's still um, if it's still active, so I, I don't know about that. Um, okay, how can we support Muslim schools? Um, essentially, the best way to support Muslim schools is to put your kids in them. Okay, <laughs> put your kids in them. I know that a lot of these schools they have wait lists, um, and and I know it's tough because um, I know, for example, one family that wanted to put their kids very early on, but they couldn't. Right for one of the challenges with, with Muslim schools, and this is something we're also, inshallah, trying to change, is that in Muslim schools, generally speaking, we don't have funding for, at least at, least at our school, I'll tell you, um, having kids with de developmental, uh, developmental disabilities is a challenge. So mild autism, learning disabilities, um, deaf and blind students, right? Whereas in public school, they can get support. In private schools, it's tougher, right? So that is one of the, uh, that's one of the challenges. But generally speaking, I would say attend the fundraisers, donate if you're able, try to put your kids in public school. If you yourself don't have kids, tell people about the school. Um, there's many ways to support the Muslim school, but, but those, are, those are some of them, right? Because um, unlike a public school, private schools, they survive basically through enrollment. So you have to put your kids in them for the school to survive. So I would say, um, here, here's, here's the easy way to put it. Any parent, who has a choice between a public school and a private, uh, between a public school and Muslim school, I would 100% Muslim school. Unless there's something uh, objectionable about the Muslim school, if it's a standard Sunni Muslim public school, go with a Muslim school, no doubt. Because at least the kids will be praying. At least the kids will learn about Ramadan. At least they won't be celebrating Halloween and Christmas and, and doing music and all, and, and all these other things, right? So put the kids, in the Muslim school, it's a no-brainer. Now, I understand also the challenge that not every parent can put their kids in public school, which is why uh, I address, uh, which is which basically my answer comes in for the previous sister about um, just being involved as much as possible, trying to develop that loving relationship with the child, um, and maybe even if it warrants it, like if it warrants it, for me the answer would be pretty simple: leaving the country or leaving the province to go to a province that does have a Muslim school. And there are provinces in Canada that do have Muslim high schools. So those are, um, those are the options. Um, yes, so I'm gonna read Sister Rafia's yes. So Sister Rafia, uh, I'm a BC certified teacher and work both in Muslim and independent school and Mont uh, Montessori school. In my experience, there's fitna to some level in all schools. Muslim schools are by far the choice if you have that option, as Brother Omar said, for sure. Keep in mind, Muslims in the Muslim schools are all, are, um, are not all practicing or at the same level of practice. So parents still need to do their part in building a strong Islamic foundation. Absolutely. Uh, you can't throw your kid in a Muslim school and expect them to, to come out a, a, a sheikh or a maulana, right? You can't do that. You have to invest your kids. You have to invest in your kids at home and in schools. And to give you a perfect example, at our school, generally speaking, kids pray one salah in a day at our school, which is Dhuhr salah. The other four are prayed at home. If they're praying that one salah, but at home their parents are not praying, or they're not fasting, or or whatever they're doing, they're doing whatever things, then how can we expect that child to really get the maximum benefit, right? So raising your child isn't just schooling; it's 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 schooling, it's at home, it's life experiences, it's family trips, it's cooking in the kitchen, it's it's etiquette at the dinner table. Everything is basically um, education. So uh, absolutely, to reinforce what Sister said, parents still need to do their part in building a strong Islamic foundation. 
Yes. Um, is there a way to sponsor kids who cannot financially afford it? I would say um, absolutely. I know at our school there is a fund for, um, for kids or for parents who are not able to afford it. Um, the best thing to do, I think, is to get in contact with the school that you want to sponsor, whether it's BC Muslim School, Surrey Muslim School, or Iqra. Um, get in contact with them and, and just say you would like to uh, sponsor kids who cannot financially afford it. Um, and and uh, may Allah reward you for that, uh, because that is, I think, one of the best investments you can make. Uh, because like I said, it's not, it, how do I say this? It's no longer passive fitna anymore. And what I mean by passive fitna, it's no longer just them experiencing trials from the outside. Our kids are being attacked. They're no longer on the, um, they're no longer just basically on the field. They're no longer just in the school. They're literally being attacked by this new ideology, by, by the Soji curriculum, right? It's no longer just like, okay, well, I'm just going to do my own thing and just watch. No, you are being forced to accept this. You're being taught this, right? So um, this is I, one of the best investments you can make. Now, those are a lot of the written questions. If anybody has any questions that they would just like to say, I'll, I'll keep taking both. But uh, if anybody, you could just, uh, inshallah, raise your hand and then just um, uh, unmute your mic and you can say your question. Okay, Sister Serena made a very good uh, point. I'm not sure if this was mentioned, but Biology 11, which teaches evolution in a very anti-religion way, from what I've heard from others who took it, is optional and does not affect their ability to be successful in Biology 12 or to be accepted uh, to University for Sciences and Engineering. Yeah, so once you get to a certain point, um, you are allowed to, you have an elective, I believe in, um, you have an elective of, of, you know, I don't want to say uh, without fully confirming, but I do believe that you have an elective when it comes to certain sciences, okay? Um, and the whole idea of teaching evolution to kids, I think it really comes down to the teacher. Because if you have a staunch atheist as your teacher, which many, many teachers are, some of them aren't, but if you have a staunch atheist, they're going to they're gonna paint evolution as, as a justification for atheism, which really it isn't. And I actually, uh, part of the grade seven curriculum is actually teaching kids about evolution and natural selection. Um, and basically, and I think this is just beneficial knowledge for, for everyone to know, the theory of evolution in and of itself does not explain the origins of life. It does not explain the origins of life. It explains the diversity of the life that we see. Okay. So if somebody were to look at it just from that perspective, then you, it, it doesn't justify becoming an atheist because somebody could say, well, I believe that there's many different animals, which Allah says in the Quran. Um, but the theory of evolution in of itself doesn't explain the origins of that. You need a further explanation. So somebody can't say evolution, therefore I'm an atheist. It doesn't make sense. You need an alternative explanation and that alternative explanation is Allah Azza wa Jal. Who made that first organism before it got the ability to reproduce? Who made that first organism? Allah Azza wa Jal. So there's ways to teach evolution in ways that aren't um, anti-religion, but it comes down to the teacher. And this is why it's so important to have qualified Muslim teachers. And I know in our, in our communities, um, I know that there is, being a teacher might not be a first choice for a lot of, for a lot of our, our, our parents. Um, maybe they might say, no, doctor, engineer, pharmacist. Um, this is just the reality of a lot of, our, a lot of the cultures from where we come from. Uh, but being a teacher is the sunnah. It, it, it's basically one of the jobs of all the prophets, okay? And it is something that can be extremely rewarding. And it's something that um, I think is crucial. We need Muslim teachers. We need practicing Muslim teachers. Okay. And the fact that you get summers off is also amazing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that's another incentive. If you have someone in your family or yourself uh, who's considering, who's undecided about what to do with their life, um, seriously consider teaching because you can make a difference. Absolutely. You can make a difference. And all of us probably remember uh, the teachers that we had when we were younger. Right. So um, any other questions before we continue, inshallah? Maybe I can make a lecture about how to become a teacher. Absolutely. That'd be a good one, inshallah. Um, I think before we, we decide to, before we kind of discuss where to go forward with future lectures, I'll just see if anybody has any uh, other questions about kind of like anything we discussed today, and then we'll just discuss 
where you uh, would like to see, like what you would like to see moving forward as parents, like uh, other talks, et cetera. Because we can organize lectures, we can get uh, principals in maybe, we can get um, admins in, we can, we, can do, we can do other things like that. We can get other Muslim teachers in. So inshallah, the, the, the whole objective is to benefit the community inshallah. Yes, Jazakallah khair. Sister Rafia is uh, sharing the curriculum. Um, uh, the curriculum website. If you literally just type in BC curriculum, you'll get it over there. Or if you just type in uh, BC social studies seven curriculum or six or five or whatever, you'll see exactly what the curriculum is and what teachers are kind of um, teaching to essentially. Okay, since it looks like the questions have kind of gone down a little bit. Um, okay, going forward, um, what would you like to see like talks about or lectures on? So how to become a teacher is one of them. Uh, would you like, like what, what other topics or subject areas or, or what would you find beneficial? What would help you um, as parents or as, as future parents um, when it comes to uh, education in public schools? Are there any topics that you'd like to see lectures on or halakas or workshops about, essentially? Are there any topics? That's a great question. Homeschooling practical guide. <clears throat> I think that's that's very important. We can keep that in, inshallah. Making friends, helping Muslim youth connect any programs. Absolutely. In this day and age with COVID, uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but there are still ways. Um, absolutely, absolutely. This is uh, one of the, I look back at my, my, my personal life and one of the challenges I felt was, was having Muslim friends. Um, and it's not so much about um, it's not so much about the presence of Muslims because there were other Muslims in my high school, but it's about making Muslim friends appealing to someone who is um, who maybe their mind is elsewhere, right? So, so that's what that, I think that's part of the challenge as well. Parents with very young children are introduced to Soji in a very indirect way. So, as Brother Omar said, having open communication is so important. Not only to build relationships with the children, also uh, know what your child has been learning or indirectly being exposed to. Absolutely. You'll see that that book that I showed you, ages four, ages four to eight, and they're learning the acceptance of this, okay? And not only that, in the other lesson plan, they were making a dress for a boy. They were drawing a dress for a boy, okay? So, so it, it's not, uh, this is what I mean by Muslims are on the defensive now. Like they're being attacked now. It's not just like, oh, we go to school, we get by. You are being attacked now. So we have to know how to respond as parents and as children. How the community can help the schools, what kind of programs that the community can give in the masjid so that can... Yes, very good question. Um, this is something that, we have discussions about, and this is something, inshallah, we're hopefully we're, we're working towards. I know people personally uh, who are working towards youth involvement, which is huge. Um, kids may not want to attend the halakha on Friday night, but they would love to maybe go to a youth center and play basketball or, or uh, watch a movie or do something like that. that so, so this is how we can get our kids involved, engaged. Um, and this is, this is uh, something, inshallah, People in our community are working on, and, uh, but we can always do a better job. And inshallah, we need to work together to make this a reality, inshallah. Um, in terms of how the, can the community help, uh, help the schools, really, um, I would say, put your kids in the schools and be involved. Uh, parents can be involved in so many ways. You can be involved in fundraisers. You can make hot lunches for the kids, which generate money. I think they generate money for the school. Um, you, can, you can do various fundraisers, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's many, many ways to be involved. Um, but you just need to make the first step to put your kid in the school or try to put your kid in the school and then be involved, be involved in the PAC, the parent advisory committee, um, get to know your teachers, know what's going on. 
um, and no other parents because other parents are going through the same things as you probably, right? So, so uh, I think that's, that's one of the best things to do. And what kind of programs in the community can, can give in the masjids? Um, that's, a, that's a great, I think that just generally, uh, generally speaking, I know a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like HIPS programs, um, a, lot of, a lot of programs that uh, designated or dedicated to teaching our kids or having them memorize the Quran. But I think one thing that we can all do a better job of is, is uh, broadening our horizons and getting kids maybe like, um, maybe programs that focus less on memorizing the Quran, but on understanding it or uh, knowing maybe like story time, the seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, games night, youth night, um, et cetera, et cetera. People don't know this, but we actually have a Muslim youth center in Surrey. We have a Muslim youth center in Surrey. It's a dedicated building um, and it's there. So we just, inshallah, need to maximize these institutions and, and just make the most out of them. And any uh, youth weekly halakha, um, uh, Sister Diane, if you could email me, uh, this is something that we are thinking about, um, uh, but please email me uh, about that and inshallah, I'll, I'll see if, uh, if uh, there's one thing that comes to mind, but please email me, uh, that's for Sister Diane. I only know of youth halakas at MAC. Um, absolutely, this, this, is the, um, this is a lifelong journey, helping kids feeling proud about their Muslim identity. Uh, this is a lifelong, uh, it's, a life, it's a lifelong endeavor, essentially. Um, there you go, Sister uh, Rafia runs a youth club. Uh, there you go, please private messenger if interested. Oh, sorry, a book club uh, for, for ages nine to 12. Yes. Yeah, there you go, uh, Muslim Youth Center. Uh, so people, alhamdulillah, people know about these programs. If there's a Muslim mentorship program for Muslim youth going into high school, for a child that goes to Islamic school until grade seven and then, and then go to a public high school in grade eight, it becomes very, yes. I actually had, um, I had, uh, a number of Muslim kids. So I was at my high, the high school that I was working at was Queen Elizabeth. For those of you who don't know, it's in North Surrey. So there's a large Muslim population there. Alhamdulillah. A lot of my students were Muslim. Um, and one of them, Alhamdulillah, actually uh, completed his hifs of the Quran while he was in my class. Um, Alhamdulillah. So uh, to answer your question, I think this is something that is absolutely crucial. It would just require um, a cooperation with the Surrey school board or other school boards. Um, and I, I don't know how they would respond to that. Um, but that's why I'm saying if you have a high school, then you kind of just, um, you bypass that problem. Instead of giving that, getting the mentorship in the high school in somebody else's jurisdiction, you do it in your own jurisdiction. So I think a mentorship is, is, is key. You have grade sevens being mentored by grade twelves. I think that's absolutely key, but it's tough when you go into a public school and you're just asking them and out of their mercy, or out of their, their whatever, their, their, they would let you, right? So I know that it can be, religion can be a sensitive topic because I tried having Jummah at my school. I tried starting a Jummah Salah at my school because I'm like, you know, when, when, uh, when uh, daylight savings hits, Asr comes in at like 2.15 or something like 2.19. And, and, and I have to pray Asr before the, the school day even ends. And Jummah, same thing. So I asked, I asked the, the district uh, if I could do Jummah there. And they said I couldn't because teachers can't be in the role of religious leader, right? Um, so alhamdulillah, they accommodated me to go to Jama'ah, but um, those challenges might be present is all I'm saying. But so the best way is just to have your own high school and, and do the mentoring program there. Um, yes, and MYC is planning to restart program soon once COVID restrictions are relaxed a bit, inshallah. Um, Yes, so I hope inshallah I got all the questions. So here in Vancouver, it's, uh, it's uh, Mughrib has entered. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to email me at the, uh, oh, sorry, I think you can all, assuming you can all see my screen, no? Yeah, so that's my email, sorry. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm also okay if like, there's a lot of other people who have a lot of other questions. I'm also okay with resuming after Maghrib Salah. Uh, but if not, then inshallah, we could just end it here. Uh, all your feedback will be taken into consideration and we will inshallah decide what to do moving forward. But um, I just want to say this is, uh, this has been a huge blessing for me, alhamdulillah, to be even able to, to be here and, and, and share this information with you because it's something I feel very strongly about. And may Allah reward you for, for being parents who, who are really concerned with the, with, the, with the welfare of your children. 
And astaghfirullah uh, li wa lakum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Um, so with that being said, if, if anybody has any questions, please state them now. Otherwise, inshallah, we will uh, conclude the session if it's okay with the moderators, and then we will, uh, we will go from there. So.